Welcome to Define, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we talk to Decentralized Derivatives Protocol, Perpetual Protocol, just after their V2 launch on Optimistic Ethereum. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. Today, we have Nick and Yenwen from Perpetual Protocol. So generally, how we like to start out is great if you guys could intro yourselves and kind of give a little bit of background on how you got started at, at what you're doing at, at Perp and how, how you got into the space in general. Sure. So let me start first. So one of, I'm one of the co-founder of uh, Perpetual Protocol. So my co-founder and I, uh, we've been like working together for what I mean, like Scott from like 2015, I think. And then we have been like working on different things like uh, on like social app, on like uh, e-commerce app. I mean, trying to find kind of like what we are actually good at. And uh, I think in the end of 2017, we see Crypto Kitty and uh, we feel that it's really cool. I, I have been like uh, building games before. So I feel that, wow, it's a really good idea because you can actually own the assets you have this like uh, you know you can trade the asset i mean um the, the asset you own you know they, they cannot just like uh, you know inflate it like uh you know create lots of like similar asset from the i mean operator side so i think it's really cool but uh after we get into it we feel that uh, it's a little bit hard to build a good game based on that so but uh, at the same time we see a lot of other projects I, we feel that DeFi is really interesting although there is no DeFi yet i mean at that time only like uh, several ones like maker like compound announced that they are going to do a money market that sounds really cool so we decide that uh, we should spend more time on DeFi, and uh, uh actually ends up coming up with uh option protocol and uh it actually fell uh we work on that for about a year but uh, it doesn't really go anywhere at the market crash in 2018 but we actually end up joining Binance Lab so Binance have a uh, kind of like incubation at that time so we went to like San Francisco joined that they actually give you like some sick money so you can work on your project so we pivot to another like crypto accounting software we're working with accountant in 2018 2019 uh, the market is not good but uh I mean, there's always need for accounting, so we work on that product. But uh, I think in the end of like 2019, we see that Uniswap actually picking up. There is like uh, synthetic that's a really interesting staking model that we feel mm-hmm. that is really exciting. So we kind of like uh, actually want to pivot back to DeFi. So uh, drop that po- uh, accounting product and then uh, start po- perpetual protocol, I think beginning of like 2020. So it's just like, uh, you know, we, we we have been like skating in the ecosystem for a while. I've been doing different things, but I think 2020 is the time we start doing, I mean, really like working on the, a perpetual, I mean, like a, a DeFi project. Yeah. So I think this, yeah, the thing we learned is that the, the A&M, and skating is really powerful. And from mm-hmm. like Uniswap, they proved that that the skating, I mean, like the whole skating model of synthetic is so interesting. So we actually want to combine these two and then create another product. So I think that's how we begin. You know, at the time when you, when you decided to pivot and switch to, to 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 launching a perpetual swap product, what was kind of the, your view of like the landscape at that time? Like, who were you thinking? You know, your competitors were, and why was that what you chose to take on? That's a good question. So, at the time, um, there are like several people like working on like A and M for a perpetual uh, contract. So I think they are like future swap. I think they start at the same time as us. And, uh, they are, uh, actually only future swap, future swap, I think. But uh, I think that's, uh, that's okay. I mean, like our main competitor at that time, we always like, talk about like Binance. But you were incubated I mean, by Binance, right? Was, I mean, was there an issue there? Like was Binance a little bit, was that sensitive? No, no, no. Yeah, they're totally cool with that. Uh, you build another DAX or something. I mean, and it, because it's a guy, I mean, to be honest, no one at that time feel that the uh, DeFi is near. Mm. 
I mean, they right. feel that if I is like, you know, like five years away and then, you know, like, uh, we look at, you know, BMAX, we think if we, you know, at that time, we we think that if we are doing really well for this project, we mm-hmm. can get like, I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, like, like 1% of the market of by, uh, BMAX. Right. That's actually our target, like 1% of BMAX. Mm-hmm. But right now, I mean, I think it's totally different. Yeah. That's super interesting. What were the kind of initial challenges that you saw when you, when you were launching? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, uh, we, I think the challenge we have is that how to build an AM that's, um, you know, will, so we, you have a trader, you have like arbitrager, you have, uh, liquid provider maybe. And then how do you, can you balance that, uh, I mean, all three party. Um, I mean, uh, create a system that, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, you don't really favor like one part of a party. Uh, so we actually figure out that how we can remove the liquid provider from this, I mean, like, um, this system. So there is only a trigger trick against each other. So I think that's, uh, that's interesting that how we figure that out. Mm-hmm. But, uh, to be honest, I think the challenge is that, uh, it's really hard to, I mean, like, um, it's, it's, it's new. It's really hard to persuade uh, the investor, the partners, I mean, or like other people that it actually work. Right. Uh, so, I mean, we, we actually have a hard time, like, fundraise. So at the time, mm. I mean, I'm more traditional. So, you know, at the time we want to go out and fundraise. Of course, I mean, like, uh, when we, when we, when we start fundraise, the COVID happened. Mm. So, I mean, like, uh, it's a little bit chaos at that time, but, uh, we actually has a, a really hard time fundraise. When you were fundraising, I mean, how did you, you said that it was difficult to kind of explain the concept and convince investors. Like, what was your pitch and how did you kind of explain the product? So, the first, we pitched that. So, we are kind of like a Uniswap, but we use the XYK in a different way so mm-hmm. that you don't need a liquidity provider. So trigger, trigger against each other, just like what I told you. But people don't believe in this. I mean, like, uh, most of people, I mean, like, they feel that uh, there must be a counterparty. Where is your counterparty? Mm-hmm. You cannot create a system without a counterparty. So, I mean, like, um, I remember at this first talk with, like, a market point. So Kyle was in that talk. I mean, like, what was in that, uh, I mean, interview. And uh, we, we talked about how it works. And then by just uh, mentioning it, but... Uh, I think the end of that talk, Kyle just throw out like, I don't think it works, and then it ends. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because I think like Tony at that time, they he he kind of understand this, but he's not really sure. So I think so they he, they come back, and then we actually create a lot of charts. We create a spreadsheet that actually that you play around with it, mm-hmm. with some concept. So spreadsheet is kind of like in M, but um, you know like in Excel. So it kind of like you can actually input orders and then you see how it works mm-hmm. inside the AM. So we create that and then we have like several meetings and then in the end that they kind of like get this concept. But uh, yeah, it's, I think a lot of like investors we talk to, they just bounce from our like first chat because it's a little bit tricky, I think, to understand. Mm. When was the moment that you guys came up with the, this this concept, this pi- kind of pioneering concept? It's like the beginning of like 2020. I think we just like um, it's just like a normal like discussion that uh, you know within a team, and we you know mm-hmm. we just like using a whiteboard that we draw, and then we say you know like we actually at some point of time we figured that why do we need a degree provider because. I mean, a lot of time we focus on like, how can we reduce the impairment loss from a grid provider? Right. So we actually have that, uh, we do a lot of things simulations. We use like a scope of model trying to provide the best like, uh, market making strategy. That's, I mean, we use it just different ways mm-hmm. trying to reduce the, the impairment loss or like a loss from the grid provider. But, uh, in the, in the end, we kind of like, I mean, you kind of like look at the chart in different way. And then you see that, uh, we actually can, once we have a virtual asset, we actually can have, I mean, like, um, we actually can remove the equipment provider. Yeah. So just like one meeting and then we change the whole design and then mm-hmm. we, we, we do a lot of a simulation trying to make sure it works. Yeah. 
Okay, and so and so eventually, you know, you managed to fundraise and and launch your V1. You know, like what are some of the kind of milestones looking back at that V1 that you're proud of? Nick, do you want to take this? Sure, it's it's an interesting question. I, I guess the big one would be the the initial kind of milestone when we hit kind of a billion in in trading volume. That was quite a big one for us, just given that we we haven't kind of in, we, we didn't really throw any incentives at it. And then I think now we've kind of seen over kind of the 12 odd months, the 30, 32 odd kind of billion, that's fully unincentivized. And I think there's, there's something to be said around kind of maybe growth the old fashioned way without just throwing money at it. But I, I, like for me, that, that'd be kind of one of the biggest things, like one of the biggest milestones, at least like the unincentivized growth uh, element. You guys have kind of evolved considerably since then. What's the landscape now? What's your competitive landscape looking like now compared to how you viewed it you know, at the start of 2020, for example, or a year ago even? It's different in that obviously centralized exchanges are still kind of a very big kind of competitor in the space, I guess. And then I guess if you if you segment the space out, there is generally speaking kind of AMM styled uh, derivatives. There's a lot of actually spin-offs of Perp or things inspired by Perp, at least the V, uh, the, the V1, which is, which is nice to see. And then obviously you've got your central limit order book style, like centralized exchange type products, um, that are looking to kind of, the, the way I see it is kind of, uh, they're trying to take FTX and trying to decentralize it. So DIDX being kind of a big one. And I think everyone's kind of got different, they're optimizing for kind of different outcomes. So. We've taken a really big kind of focus on composability and are trying to really optimize the composability. So um, that's why I guess it was heartbreaking when we kind of um, decided to stop the VAMM model. Well, the, the, the kind of virtual liquidity side of the model, just because we had kind of pioneered it and started it. But we really do believe that the new kind of V2 model that we've launched allows kind of both the flexibility for traders and market makers whilst kind of taking the really nice characteristics of the AMM model uh, and kind of combining the two together. So I would still say from the competitive landscape, like uh, that's kind of where we are really focusing on rather than kind of let's just take FTX and kind of decentralize it. Right. It's interesting. So, I mean, could you expand on V2 and, and kind of why you think it is, you know, why it has this USP of, of being composable? Sure, sure. I, so first off, I guess like the... The AMM model is, is um, in general, is a lot more composable than the limit order ones right now, just because I, right now, at least I believe from, from like an FTX perspective, the settlement layer is obviously uh, on-chain now. The order book is is not, right? Like it's, it's still kind of off-chain. It's still quite centralized. And so if you really want to kind of connect and really be composable, it's very, very hard to do it in kind of like a decentralized manner. So the AMM kind of uh, component makes it very, very composable uh, for people to plug in. I think secondly is that what a lot of other AMM protocols haven't, or, sorry, AMM based kind of perpetual protocols haven't done is that the, if you think about the fact that you're having a fixed curve, um, that actually limits the design space of what you can do as kind of like a developer and a builder on top of perp. And we definitely saw this with V1, right? Like the only things that were really potentially happening is people kind of trading and opening kind of long levered positions mm -hmm. or short positions, maybe some arbitrage, but then the design space for kind of someone to kind of come in and, and do some quite complicated things was kind of uh, a lot harder just because everything is kind of predetermined for you. So, with V2, and especially kind of because it's built on top of Uniswap V3, we inherit a lot of those really nice characteristics that we have um, in that you can now provide liquidity in kind of and express yourself similar to the way that you would do with an order. And, and, and because of that, there's a lot of kind of research that's been happening around it. And there's quite a lot of builders now that are seeing the, the value in building on top of this and kind of using perpetual as kind of a base layer, which is, which is really where we see ourselves um, in the future, we, we we really suspect that I don't know what the number is, but like a large percentage of the volume will come from this kind of design space that occurs. And the end user may not even know that they're kind of using perpetual, but they might be connecting with a structured product and that structured product kind of then uses perp and they don't even see perp and they don't know that they're using perp. But that's kind of where I think the really, really interesting space is going to be going forward. Definitely. And, you know, to your point, like, I'd imagine a lot of people imagining decentralized perpetuals that, you know, 
right now their expectation is go go onto a user interface, sling along, and then that's what it is. How would you imagine, you know, what are some of these potential use cases that you're excited about? Like, you know, you kind of touched on it there. Yeah, we've we've seen a couple that have come out and, and it's kind of the ones that you, I guess the low, not, not low hanging fruit, but the ones that you can kind of imagine just because we've seen it in kind of TradFi before. So the, the V3 kind of strategy providers are, are very interesting. If you think about it, if, if the strategy works on Uniswap, it'll work on PERT because all we're doing is adding leverage to it. So you're mm-hmm. basically increasing the, the, the returns that you have. So that's quite a simple one. One that's quite interesting that's popping up is, is around kind of structured products. So how do we combine various kind of different products uh, and protocols together and, and create the structured product for retail that, that makes it very, very easy for them to understand? And the third one I'll probably mention is the brokerage style model is, is, is very interesting where staked out, for example, like you take various kind of financial products, you kind of bundle them all together in a very nice and, and, and kind of elegant UI so that the retail user, they, they don't necessarily care about the underlying, but it's just like a very nice user experience. So those are probably the, th- the three ones that we're seeing the most of. There are some kind of weird and wacky ones that we're starting to see come out of the works, like how can you use Perp to create leverage tokens in a, in a way that is probably better just because we're on an L2 now? And then can you use that as collateral in a different protocol, right? So I think we're, we're going to start seeing this expansion of, of this other unknown space that we, we just haven't seen before. But yeah, I think we're only at the beginning for those ones. And now you're just starting to to move on to L2. I see you guys have just launched. Is it Curie? Yeah, I'd love to love to hear a bit more about Curie. Um, sure, sure. So, uh, so Curie is the codename of our V2. So, uh, like you said, uh, I mean the V1 actually we launched like last year, last December. I mean, like, it mm-hmm. has been running like for almost a year. It's actually doing quite well. Like I said uh, at the beginning, we feel that uh, if we can capture like one percent of the market. I mean, like big max market, that's pretty good. But it actually ends up like uh, doing really well. I mean, we don't incentivize anything, but uh, uh, we have like, uh, I mean, for today, I think it's like 33 billion like trading volume totally. Amazing. Yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, one of the reasons is that we build this on SDI, which is a side chain. I mean, like we are actually one of the 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 derivative project that the build on top of layer two. I mean, like, so I think that actually benefit us a lot. I mean, and, um, but, uh, there are like some issues with V1. I mean, I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, at the beginning that uh, we have this new design that we remove the liquidity provider, but, uh, it really that, that not that easy. I mean, it creates some impact in the system that, uh, we don't really like, uh, spend a lot. I mean, like, we, uh, I think we know that, but we don't know the impact is actually much bigger than we think. So we, I mean, in like February, we look at our system and then we found like some issues that, uh, uh, we want to get, um, kind of like to see if we can like find a solution for that. So we create another team that doing a lot of research and then we actually come out like uh, more than 10 like different ways. I mean, trying to solve this, like, uh, we, we call this, like, long short screw problem. So we have, like, more longs than shorts or more shorts than longs. I mean, on our V1 exchange at the given time and then how we can rebalance that. So spend lots of time, actually, like, three or four months on that. In the end, uh, we, we pick, like, um, like, like this, like, curry way, which is actually mm-hmm. go back and then build on top of Uniswap V3. And then reintroduce the liquidity provider. Um, the, the best thing about this design is of us, of course, like Nick said that we, uh, I mean, like we kind of like abandoned the VAM that uh, we mm. created before because I mean, we add the liquidity provider back. But the good thing, of course, is, co- I mean, like it's using this like concentrated liquidity. So people, I mean, like liquidity provider can pick the range they want to provide the liquidity right. and then it's, very efficient and also at the same time like Nick said it creates a lot of design space for I mean liquid provider for the traders I mean like everyone who wants to build on top of um, perpetual I mean V2 they have I mean 
they, they can actually do much more than before. So I think that the, the benefit outweighs the, the shortcoming. So we just want to go ahead with this new design. Yeah. So like things like, I think like uh, June, we have been like working like around like five months on this. Yeah. So we actually finally launched it like yesterday. So you can actually go to like perp.com and you can give it a try. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool, man. And I, I, I see that it's on optimism, right? Yes. Yeah. It's on optimism. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning, actually, we want to build on top of Arbitron. We mm-hmm. have, I mean, we, I mean, until actually several weeks ago, we still like working on Arbitron. I mean, right. we have a testing and checking complication on Arbitron, uh, testing yep. Yeah. yeah, I participated in that. <laughs> oh, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, but in, end, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but in the end, we actually found some like issues that uh, with Arbitron that uh, we are afraid that uh, we need mm-hmm. more bandwidth than they can provide. Uh, but you know, right now they it's kind of a cap. I mean, on Arbitron right now, and then they are waiting for their like uh, next version, Nitron like uh, launch, and then they can raise that cap. So, yeah, so, but we still want to launch like, you know, like this month or so we actually end up going to Alpington. So will you be deploying across several, uh, further, like uh, onto different L2s? Yes, yes, definitely. Yep. So once like Nitron launch, we will definitely review it and then mm-hmm. try to find a way to redeploy it on Alpington or like uh, other place that Uniswap V3 go to because we have like this dependency on mm-hmm. Uniswap V3. So we have to kind of like wait for them to deploy on auto chain and then right. and build on top of that. Since you kind of inspired or sort of interconnected with, with Uniswap in some ways, you know, I was kind of, I was going to ask like why originally, why you chose to, to build in the, the ETH ecosystem. Yeah. I, I'd be interested, curious to know what your thoughts on the view of say perps on ETH or, you know, L2s versus on something like Solana. Be curious to know what your views are there? That's a good question. So I'm more like ETH maximalist. I mean, like I like <laughs> ETH so much. I mean, uh, uh, it's a good answer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, of course, we look at Solana. Uh, I mean, uh, that's really cool. I mean, really good technology, real, really great like community there. Uh, but for I think there is like, I mean, how we approach the problem is a little bit different. I mean, like on Solana system, most of the people, they approach like, I mean, DAX through Ogrebook. So it's more natural because they feel that, uh, you know, because the PPS is so high, then, then you can build a Ogrebook on that, on top of that. The transaction fee is so cheap. And so it's a little bit different from like what we think. I mean, I personally believe that, uh, you know, A&M, is the way to go because you want to be composable. There are lots of like good thing. I mean, on AM. So I think it's just like different way to look at things. We do think about like how we should build on top of Solana. We might, but you know, the thinking of, uh, is a little bit different. So we, on, on Solana, we are, we, we need to change our thinking to more like older book model than just like AM. So mm-hmm. I think that's a really big difference. Uh, Nick, do you have anything to add on this? There is one one interesting point, I guess, from like from a fundamental design perspective, which I think. So, if I take a couple of steps back, one of the like like there's two things that we have set out from the beginning to do. It's kind of like the two driving principles that we have. One is kind of accessibility. So, how do we make products accessible to kind of retail, and it's not just the quote unquote, like walled garden where you have to be sophisticated, which just means how much money you have. And then the second one is around kind of uh, simplicity. So how do we make these products that are accessible to retail simple as well? And how do we combine these two together? And so if you think about an order book in the traditional sense of how it works, it's actually very heavily skewed towards larger institutions and it kind of squeezes out retail. Just, Just in like the simple fact of like, it's a first in first out just basically means whoever's got the fastest infrastructure will fill an order first. And then, um, and then you get kind of as a retail, you, you, you die by a thousand cuts. Basically you have no idea that someone's <laughs> kind of bleeding the money out slowly. Whereas with an AMM, the, the, the model that we have, it's actually a run. So it doesn't matter necessarily how fast you are because as long as you're within that epoch, 
you will receive fees as, yeah. as a market maker. And, and I think it's not thought about a lot, but like, if we think about like why we started Ethereum, why we started all of this, this is actually a big difference between kind of the two models. So Solana is super, super interesting in so far that like the gas is cheap, it's fast. From an experience perspective, it's good. Um, but the problem that I see is if we just replicate the order book model there, we're, we're basically taking the old kind of uh, hierarchy and we're just placing it within kind of um, crypto again, which is kind of like, mm. then what, what's the point, right? Like, it, it is the way I feel about it. So, uh, it's definitely interesting, but I, I, I don't think taking what worked in kind of, I mean, worked in TradFi over to kind of crypto is, is, is necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I feel like it's almost, it's almost like we're at this kind of like divergent point in, in, in kind of crypto, right? Where, there seem to almost be these two factions or camps, or maybe, maybe it's not the case at all, but it's, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You do, you do make some interesting points with, with that in mind, what do you think the, the perpetual swap landscape will be like in, in a few years? That's a good question. So, uh, let me go first. I think, I mean, I personally think that, um, it will become the kind of like the, the, the base layer, like Uniswap. So, you know, we have Uniswap. I mean, a lot of people, build, I mean, we build on top of Uniswap. A lot of other people build on top of Uniswap. It's a base layer of the, the spot market, right? So, I mean, like uh, all the token traders can go, th- um, can go through Uniswap. I mean, for us, we want to be that base layer for leverage trading. So once you have like need, like you want to, sh- you know, hedge, or you want to mm-hmm. actually, I mean, like use leverage to increase your capital efficiency, then you go to us and then you build on top of us. So I do believe that perpetual swap, I mean, the product itself, we will not have as many users as Uniswap because it's, it will be hard to understand the concept. I mean, the funding mm-hmm. rate and all this. And also at the same time, I mean, retail might get wrapped because I mean, like, uh, it's, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, you need a lot of, like, uh, knowledge to really, like, handle it well. But, uh, it's actually the best, a uh, really great example that it can be the base area so people can build on top of it. So I do believe that, uh, they are, I mean, for us, our user might 10x in the future, but, uh, the projects that use us will be 100x. So there will be a lot of people, like, even like banks, even like brokerage house, they build on top of, of our project. Or other like A and M like perpetual project, I don't know, but uh, I do believe that in the future you will be like base area. Nobody really like, um, no, not really nobody, but only a small amount of people like really interact with this project. But actually, most of people they interact with like perpetual project indirectly. So I do believe that that's the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that what, you know, what's the most important kind of metric of progress that we should look for around perpetual? So for us, I think we check, I mean, uh, the most important like, um, like metrics we check is definitely the tracking. I mean, tracking volume, like, uh, the, and also like, uh, uh, of course, like daily, weekly and all this and then, uh, the users. So we have like, uh, lots of like, uh, different like, uh, metrics that uh, we separate out the retail and uh, the you know the the whales and then also like program traders and then we see mm-hmm. the difference so of course we want to grow the retail more yep so i think that's actually our main focus on i mean like fundamental wise that uh, the things we are looking at uh nick do you have anything to add to all this in the um look yeah, I think, I think the number of, the number of projects that are building on top of PERP is also quite a, quite a big one for us. Yenwen did a thread not too long ago. I believe it was like 20 or 25 that we currently have. And, and, and basically I think a key metric for success is like how many of these projects, um, will integrate. And obviously that then kind of rolls up into the high level metrics of kind of users and trading volume mm-hmm. and whatnot. But it's definitely one area that we're kind of, uh, growing both from like a marketing and a partnerships perspective. Amazing. And, and what are, you know, what are some developments you're excited to roll out? What can we expect to see in the kind of coming months? The big one for me is private markets. So if you look at 
I, I guess if you look at everyone right now, both centralized and decentralized, in order to list a market, you have to go through some form of like governance or risk style process. And the reason for that is because all of the assets share effectively the same insurance pool or the insurance fund. And so you want to be prudent, right? Like if, if you just launch kind of like a dog coin that, that, that listed kind of two days ago and that goes to zero, your insurance fund kind of takes a hit. With private markets, the way that we've kind of designed it was we almost see it as an isolated insurance fund that anyone can then start running. So similar to how Uniswap kind of enabled a lot of long-tail assets, we want to do the same thing. The The tricky bit, I guess, is because we have leverage, it adds a little bit of complexity. So we actually believe in the future we will probably have uh, these kind of private market DAOs that will look after all the various elements and whether they have their own front end and they kind of attract their users or whether they just use us or whether they a project comes along and says, hey, I've got three or four tokens, I just want to list them and I'll manage them myself. That's yet to be seen. But from the projects that we've kind of talked to so far, there's been some very, very interesting uh, interested parties and interesting use cases of how people can potentially use private markets kind of going forward. So there's still a lot of work that kind of has to be done here, but I think this is going to be one of the most interesting pieces kind of that will release soon. Incredible. Yeah, well, um, you know, we're certainly super, super excited to uh, to kind of work with you guys and, and help, you know, roll out some of the exciting stuff that you're doing and to our user base. So, yeah, um, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on today, guys. Unless, you know, there's something else you, you're really excited that you want to talk about. I think we can kind of call it there. The only thing I want to mention is that, uh, I mean, like, um, you know, our V2, I think is really, I mean, like uh, a new design that uh Kind of like we feel that is the most like capital efficient way if you want to trade uh perpetual. So I mean, if anyone, I mean like any any of the listener like want to give you a try, just go to perp.com, and then I mean definitely I think this is something that we are really proud of and then really excited. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I really enjoyed just trading on the, on the test net. I mean, it was super cool to see the evolution of the product. The UI is really cool. I like the kind of simple, almost like gamified style UI. It's nice. <laughs> thanks. It's very cool, guys. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks for having yep. us. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, you too, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.